21. Laying down the law. The man who does not know the nature of the law cannot know the nature of sin. John Bunyan. Churches are always to be engaged in the duty of winning the lost for Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, rather than soul winning, Proverbs 11 verse 30, churches today seem more focused on trying to attract members from competing churches. Soul winning takes a determined effort and sometimes generates frustrating outcomes. Modern soul winning methods have further compounded the problem and stymied the labors of the potential soul winner. For example, an individual is said to have been led to Christ when he bows his head and asks Jesus to come into his heart. The simplicity of the gospel is a crucial truth. However, there is no scriptural justification for this unscriptural man-made method of leading a soul to Christ. Not one verse can be produced showing that asking Jesus into one's heart has ever saved anyone. Witnessing has degenerated to proclaiming the fruits of salvation rather than the scriptural mandate of repentance. This error confuses a person's real need. This method of soul winning has led many to point their fingers at sincere well-meaning potential soul winners and accuse them of promoting a false gospel. Praise God that converts have been made in spite of these methods. The truly repentant sinner is saved when he realizes his spiritual need and desires God to forgive his sinful soul. Thankfully, asking Jesus to come into his heart may have been his way of admitting his lost and sinful condition and trusting in his newfound Savior for the remission of sins. However, many non-repentant Romans Road conversion experiences are no different from the charismatic practice of just taking Jesus into your life. The cure is preached without convincing the lost man of his sinful need. Having already tried sex, drugs, and booze, he sees Jesus as just another fat attempt at fulfilling his desire to feel good. Martin Luther declared that the first duty of the gospel preacher is to declare God's law and show the nature of sin. 1. Martin Luther was saved while studying the epistles of Romans and Galatians in order to teach these books at the University of Wittenberg. His writing was powerful and reflected his understanding of the lost sinner's need. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, was converted to Christ upon hearing a reading of Luther's preface to Romans. Although Wesley reluctantly attended the Aldersgate meeting that preceded his conversion, God nevertheless opened his heart to the truth. In the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle of Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Point two, emphasis mine. The founder of Methodism knew that his sins were taken away. He knew he was guilty of breaking God's law and needed to be saved from the law of sin and death. Today, many Bible colleges teach that the ends justify the means. The law of God is ignored and replaced with a lifestyle enhancement gospel in an attempt to lead the lost to Christ. Potential converts are told to just take Jesus and you'll feel better. Preachers are actually teaching soul, winning classes on how to trick a lost person into praying the sinner's prayer. No wonder these converts are not experiencing the magnitude of change brought on by true conversion because they remain unconverted. Much insight is gained by considering the fourfold application of God's law, the Ten Commandments, to winning souls for the cause of Christ. The law of God, I, operates as an asset against sin. Two, gives an awareness of sin. Three, calls for an acknowledgement of sin. Four, requires an adjudication of sin or an accounting for sin. If Christians truly understood the importance of using the law to lead sinners to Christ, they would be busy using it, rather than trying to convince the lost man that he simply needs Jesus. Yes, the Lord does enable a man to escape hell. However, the lost sinner first needs to understand that he is destined for hell and why that is so. Most people initially do not see themselves as bad enough to need a savior. Even most prison convicts claim their innocence. This is true of lost sinners too. Most sinners have not seen their sin in the light of scriptural truth believing they are undeserving of any punishment for their shortcomings. God's love has been overemphasized to the point that many a sinner cannot reconcile his image of a loving God with the biblical condemnation that arises from a just God. I, the law of God operates as an asset against sin. The law is one of God's greatest and most essential tools for dealing with mankind. 
God instituted the law as part of his plan to regenerate the fallen creature man and to reconcile humanity to himself. God uses the law to accomplish his plan. Felix, a proud ruler, trembled when Paul witnessed to him concerning righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Acts 24 verse 25. Paul understood how to use the law in witnessing. He explains in the scriptures that the law is good if used lawfully, 1 Timothy 1 verse 8. However, the law condemns the lost man if used unlawfully to convince the sinner that it is the means of reconciliation to God. Proverbs tells us that the law is light. KJB Proverbs 6 verse 23 For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. The King James Bible says that the law is light. The law is not a light, like a flashlight, but it is light like God. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. 1 John 1 verse 5. Once again, the modern versions seem to pervert every important truth. Consideration of the law is no exception. Neve. Proverbs 6 verse 23 For these commands are a lamp, this teaching is a light, and the corrections of discipline are the way to life. These modern versions do not teach the truth and cannot be used to preach and teach the truth. Solomon refers specifically to the law and says that it is light. He does not communicate some nebulous teaching that it is a light. Light shines through darkness, and the law is light. The law is perfect. Why, then, is the law not a central premise upon which the soul winner leads someone to Christ? The light of the law reveals the condition of the soul and the necessity for conversion. Thus, indirectly, the law converts the soul. The book of Psalms says, KJB, Psalm 19 verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Does the NIV convey the same truth? NIV, Psalm 19 verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The law does not revive the soul. It condemns the soul and therefore, indirectly plays a part in converting it. God's shining light, the law, plainly reveals all the dirt and sin concealed by spiritual darkness, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. Imagine God shining a bright light upon your sin that is the essence of the law. The light of the law reveals to the poor, lost sinner that he has transgressed against a holy, perfect, and righteous God. Conviction causes that lost man to realize his hopeless state and absolute inability to ever fulfill God's demand for perfect holiness. God demands that we be holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Colossians 1 verse 22. Anyone trying to be justified by and through the law will fail. The law reveals this truth to us and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ makes holiness in the sight of God possible. The importance of using the law to reach the lost cannot be ignored. In order to avoid missing this important truth, no further comparisons with the modern versions will be given in this chapter. Based upon the overwhelming evidence, the reader should be willing to reject these modern perversions. The emphasis of this chapter is directed toward those interested in a deeper understanding of the relationship of the law to winning souls. However, the final two chapters also present additional proof using comparisons. If you need further evidence, one book one authority by the author, containing 888 pages, is the sequel to this book. 2. The Law of God Gives an Awareness of Sin Even in our hard-hearted, sinful world, some people still readily comprehend that they are sinners. Unfortunately, this admission means very little to them since they recognize neither the extent nor the consequences of their crime, Romans 3 verse 23. The law serves as a schoolmaster to clearly communicate the nature and severity of man's transgressions against a holy God. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines a schoolmaster as he or that which disciplines, instructs, or leads. The purpose of the law today is to lead a lost person to the solution for sin. Galatians 3 verse 24 Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by Faith. The book of Galatians says we are justified by faith with the law acting as our schoolmaster enabling us to understand our need for God's grace. Historically, the church knew these truths, but more recently, it has abandoned using God's law for a social gospel considered less offensive. Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God remains one of the best-known sermons of all time.
It still strikes the heart of even the casual reader with the terrifying repercussions of having transgressed the law of Almighty God. Similarly, hymn writers of centuries past understood the need to prepare the heart of the lost for the preaching of the gospel. William R. Newell, in his song at Calvary, communicates great spiritual insight into the purpose and necessity of God's holy law in converting the soul. He knew that the word of God, the law, helped us grasp our sinful condition. At Calvary, by God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty, at Calvary. Had spurned, the type. Mr. Newell said his guilty soul turned to Calvary after he had trembled at the law of preaching and the scripture that brings about this reaction to one's sins is completely foreign to most modern churches. The lost man or woman has been brainwashed into thinking that love is the missing element in a hell, fire, and damnation sermon. However, love for the lost sinner must be the impetus behind this type of preaching and usually is. These preachers know that the love of souls is more important than increasing membership through flesh-pleasing, ear-tickling messages. John Newton wrote another song revealing that fear leads us to Christ. Fear is a foreign element to the modern church that has already rejected the truth. Consider the second stanza of Newton's most famous song, Amazing Grace. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How does grace teach one's heart to fear? Of course, the sinner when faced with the consequences of his sin, fears and trembles at the law he has broken, the law of Almighty God. Once the sinner realizes that he is guilty of offending a holy and righteous God, he yearns for the grace that brings the peace with God through forgiveness of sin. The church has lost this focus today by misunderstanding and misapplying the law's application. Though the law cannot provide redemption, it can and does bring conviction. Though the law offers no relief, it does bring a realization of your helpless state. Though the law does not justify you, it does reveal your guilty state before a holy, perfect judge. Great preachers of the past understood the law's significance. E. M. Bounds wrote many significant books, especially those dealing with prayer. The St. Louis Globe Democrat recorded the opening prayer of E. M. Bounds during revival meetings of D.L. Moody in that city. He began, Our Father, help us to come before thee with humility and reverence, with some realization of our sinfulness, our guiltiness in thy sight, some sense of thy holiness and the demands of thy law. 3. Emphasis mine, E.M. Bounds understood the significance of God's law. The sinner must recognize and understand that the law condemns the unbeliever in his sin and unbelief. No judge need pronounce the legal and spiritual condemnation because the word of God proclaims. John 3 verse 18 He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The best approach for reaching a lost man is determined by his unique spiritual condition. Is the lost person truly repentant or proud as a peacock? True scriptural evangelism is always law to the proud and grace to the humble. With the law we are to break the hard-hearted, and with the gospel we can heal the broken-hearted. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. James 4 verse 6. Christians must be scriptural in their approach to reaching the lost. The proud need the law to bring to light their lost and sinful condition. The truly humble are ready to be told about the grace that can save their wretched soul from the punishment they admittedly deserve. The proud sinner must see the law in a new light and realize his inability to fulfill its righteous demands. Without first recognizing that he is completely incapable of saving himself, a man can never truly believe on the one that fulfilled the law in all its points. Galatians 3 verse 13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. The law condemns, but Christ took upon himself every man's condemnation. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, taking upon himself our curse. The sinner must see himself as guilty under the law before he can understand the awful price paid for his sins. There is none righteous, no, not one inch, Romans 3 verse 10. God gave his law to reveal the ugly reality of one's true identity apart from Christ. 
1 Timothy 1 verse 8, But we know that the law is good, if a man use it lawfully, nine knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, ten for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for menstealers, for liars for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. The lost person must be shown why he is lost and condemned, and not merely convinced into accepting Jesus to enhance his life's quality. The sinner needs to be shown that he waits for execution day, and that God has already pardoned only those who have accepted the payment made for them on Calvary by the Son of God. When soul winners neglect using the law, the outcome is a soul damaged rather than delivered a delivered one. By offering false assurance of salvation, the lost man is further blinded. Christians must proclaim God's law, the judge, and the judgment and justice to come. Jeremiah 23 verse 5 Have you accepted this payment? Charles Finney said, The severity of the law should be unsparingly applied to the conscience until the sinner's self-righteousness is annihilated, and he stands speechless and condemned before the holy God. What a difference between Finney's expression and that of the average preacher today. Guilty sinners must be told that they have a savior who has paid the debt they owe. Has anyone told you about the debt, the payment, or the cure? It makes no sense to preach the pardon without first explaining the guilt. Modern evangelism has forsaken the law of God and its capacity to convert the soul. God gave his law to drive sinners to Christ. Instead of preaching the law to the lost man, many try to convince the individual of his opportunity to improve his life. The lost sinner is told that he will never find true peace without Jesus Christ because of the God-shaped vacuum in his heart that only God can fill. There may truly be a God-shaped vacuum inherently existing within each of us, but Christians need to show the lost person why that vacuum exists. Instead, too often, the zealous soul winner instructs the potential convert to ask Jesus to come in and fill that vacuum when the person has little to no realization of Christ's suffering or of his own sin. Preachers must show the lost how and why they must trust in Christ to save them, Ephesians 1 verse 13. Even if the sinner comes to Christ, modern methods of lifestyle enhancement witnessing leave the new convert disillusioned because he does not find the constant peace, continual joy, and lasting contentment promised by the well-meaning Christian. This unscriptural motive causes the convert to become disheartened when temptation, trials, and persecution enter his life, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, Acts 13 verse 50, Matthew 13 verse 21. Need we wonder why the majority of true converts never become faithful members in local Bible-believing churches? They quickly become disillusioned backsliders because the promised easy life if they come to Christ never materializes. The issue is not one of happiness, but one of righteousness. We should not preach and emphasize the fruits of salvation, but rather the absolute necessity of salvation. By offering the fruits of salvation, sinners will respond with impure motives, lacking the necessary repentance. Many of them will make a decision without any true conviction, and thus not truly be converted. Many churches that overemphasize church growth place a lost sinner on the assembly line and bring him out of the baptismal waters still on his way to hell. The church needs to wake up and quit using popular, unscriptural methods of evangelism. We need to preach the thou shalt nots of the Bible. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Once the sinner recognizes that he has offended the true, holy, and just God, he anxiously wants to accept the payment made for his offenses. Many good people die and go to hell because they never realize they are never good enough to be sufficiently self-justified. Preachers must preach the law in order to show the lost sinner his sin. By failing to introduce the sinner to the law, we produce more decisions for Christ but fewer converts. Paul, a Jew converted to Christ, knew the law, Philippians 3 verse 6. He knew that without the law he would never have recognized sin as sin. This truth has remained constant over the centuries. One hundred years ago, the lost man knew more Bible than most faithful church members today. Back then, even the public school elementary students knew about God's laws. The law must be preached even more vehemently in order to reveal the true nature of sin to the biblically illiterate generation of today. Romans 7 verse 7 What shall we say then? Is the law sin? 
God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The early church understood the importance of the law, why then has modern preaching neglected it? The purpose of the law is to give man the knowledge of sin. Our repentance and understanding of sin must be more than a simple horizontal repentance for our sin against man. True repentance must be a vertical realization of having broken the commandments of a holy, righteous judge. Romans 3 verse 20 Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law gives us the knowledge of sin. The knowledge of our sinful condition should make us speechless. It reveals our guilt before God. Man tends to think of himself more highly than he ought until he recognizes that God judges him according to his perfect righteous standard. God's law stops the mouth of the guilty by showing him his transgression and sinful state. Romans 3 verse 19 Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. The lost man lacking conviction of his lost state thinks the statement Jesus died for your sins to be quite foolish, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. We must first show the lost man the law that he has broken. We must show him that he is guilty of breaking that law the law of God. Until the sinner realizes his guilt, he will never come to the Savior for the solution. The lost man must be convinced that he is a transgressor. Only God's law can convince him of such a thing. James 2 verse 9, But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. 10 For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. The sinner must realize he is guilty, a lawbreaker, before he realizes his need for forgiveness. The gospel of Jesus Christ, and the redemption that it offers, makes little sense unless a person first realizes the transgression he has committed. An impenitent sinner, Romans 2 verse 5, is not ready to receive Jesus Christ. The cross is foolishness to a man who has not realized his need for the Savior. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Convincing a man to bow his head and say the sinner's prayer only further hardens his heart. The sinner must first acknowledge his transgression before he realizes the payment that made for those transgressions. 3. The law of God calls for an acknowledgement of sin. Once aware of his sin, the sinner must acknowledge his own personal participation in it. Unless he accepts and acknowledges his personal guilt in transgressing the law of God, he will simply ascribe the problem to others and miss the whole point in his own life. The sinner under conviction must be like David. He had coveted another man's wife, committed adultery with Bathsheba, murdered her husband, and lied to cover his sins. Although David broke most of the Ten Commandments, he knew the horrific consequences of his actions. He knew he had sinned against a holy and righteous God who could justifiably send him to hell. Only God's mercy spared this great king. When confronted with his sin, David pled his case the only way a sinner can by placing himself into the hands of a merciful God. Psalm 51 verse 4 Against thee, the only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Every sinner must have the same attitude concerning his sin. Each of us must recognize that we have offended God the holy, righteous God of the universe. Too many times, we consider our sins offensive only to other men, horizontally, and not to God, vertically. All sin is against God who will ultimately judge the sinner accordingly. Further insight may come by considering how our legal system handles a lawbreaker. Our system of government and our judicial system in particular were originally patterned after biblical precepts, Isaiah 33 verse 22. When man's law is broken, the courts have a system to handle the infraction. When someone steals from a store, the district, attorney handles the case for the state against the perpetrator. The jury determines his guilt or innocence. The judge issues the sentence. The crime is considered one against society. The same holds true in the spiritual realm. Your sin is against God. Following death, God will judge you and if you don't have Jesus, he will mete out pure justice and the sentence will have eternal consequences. God's long suffering has been used by many people as a means of lasciviousness rather than a time to consider the awful consequences of sin. 
2 Peter 3 verse 9 The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Don't take God's long-suffering for granted. He is willing that all come to repentance, but there is a point in time when his long-suffering comes to an end. Joseph offers another biblical example of someone who understood that sin is committed not only against man, but also against the Heavenly Father. Potiphar's wicked, adulterous wife tried to seduce Joseph. Take special note of Joseph's response to her wicked proposal. Genesis 39 verse 9 There is none greater in this house than I, and neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness, and sin against God? Fornication seems to include only the individuals involved. But God sees things differently. Fornication is a sin against God. Yes, it is also sinning against one's own body, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18, offending a perfect, holy, righteous God remains the greater sin. When you sin, your sin is against God. Your wickedness is against God. God will be your judge. Have you ever thought about that? What will it be like in heaven for you to have your entire life flash before you and be judged accordingly? If God does not see his son, he will tell you to depart, Matthew 25 verse 41. We must see our sin in the same, we must see our sin in the same light as the prodigal son viewed his sin. He returned to his father and confessed his sin to him, realizing that he had sinned against God. Luke 15 verse 21, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. How do you feel about your sin? Do you consider it merely on a superficial level without considering its spiritual consequences? Do you think that a loving God will have to accept you because you are not as bad as you could be? Paul preached something we don't hear enough about to dare repentance toward God. Acts 20 verse 21 testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God, that is what we need in this sin-sick world. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. The role of the law in leading a person to Christ is to convince the lost man of his sin and its consequences so that his faith will turn to the only remedy. Sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John 3 verse 4 Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Without the law, there is no realization of sin and one sinful condition. The sinner will never be broken in contrition until he understands sin to be the transgression of God's law. The lost man will be offended at the presentation of the gospel until he realizes what Jesus' sacrificial death means to him. He will be busy comparing himself with others whom he considers far worse than himself, though he be guilty of the same offenses. Romans chapter 2 describes this man's spiritual state. He is judging others yet guilty of the same offense. Romans 2 verse 3 And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? For or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? 5 But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. 4 The law of God requires an adjudication of sin. Adjudication means judgment of sin. God's righteousness requires that he render judgment against sin. For a law to be effective and accomplish its purpose, it must be enforced. As Romans 2 verse 5 indicates, God will execute righteous judgment of sin. Only after a lost sinner acknowledges his own impending guilty verdict and forthcoming death sentence is he ready to appreciate and accept the one and only substitute Jesus Christ. God's goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering keep us alive long enough to make a decision either for or against the truth of God. By refusing to repent of his sin, a man treasures up the wrath of God awaiting the day when his wrath will be revealed in righteous judgment. Churches are filled with this type of convert, sometimes easily recognizable. Such a person has little or no burden for his lost loved ones, friends, and neighbors. He is not concerned with living a holy, separated, spirit-filled, God-honoring life. He is simply a worldly, nominal church member. On occasion, however, such a person is the most generous of givers, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, because giving suits his guilty conscience.
Sometimes he has the outward appearance of righteousness, but inside he acknowledges his life a sham. Charles Finney wrote, Failure to use the law is almost certain to result in false hope, the introduction of a false standard of Christian experience, and to fill the church with false converts. Emphasis mine. Once the law is preached to the sinner, he must come to understand the horrific consequences of breaking God's law. Following the death of the sinner, he will stand before God in judgment. Everyone will be judged, and without the righteousness of Christ, there is no hope. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 Hebrews 9 verse 27 And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Are you ready for judgment day? God has appointed a day when he will judge the world. Now, compare this approach to the typical soul-winning approach of today. When someone comes forward in a church service after hearing the plea to accept Christ, he is quickly told to bow his head before his mind changes. Why the haste? Too many Christians are more concerned with a notch on their Bible than with snatching lost souls from hell's flames. The sinner must realize that God commands all men to repent. Acts 17 verse 30 And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now come in death all men everywhere to repent. True conversion to Christ produces within the new convert a yearning desire to keep the right type of relationship with his heavenly Father. True maturity in Christ reveals to a man that he is no longer under the law, Romans 6 verses 14 to 15. Unlike the scenario with a lost man, the law does not affect a Christian's relationship with God. The law does however apply to his relationship with others. Nevertheless, a Christian will understand and be busy showing others that same law which can truly convert the soul by pointing the lost to Christ. Psalm 19 verse 7 The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Historically, many of the great preachers knew the law's importance in converting the soul to Christ. John Wesley suggested that evangelists should preach 90% law and 10% grace. Charles Spurgeon declared, they will never accept grace until they tremble before a just and holy law. Jonathan Edwards said, almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. He depends upon himself for his own security, for are you willing to depend upon your own goodness to escape the coming judgment? Each of us must obediently follow Paul's scriptural injunction. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Are you redeemed from that curse? Galatians 3 verse 13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Christ paid the price, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. It was an awfully high price, Mark 15 verse 34. The Father placed our sins upon His Son. God will pardon no one without application of the blood that washes away, Revelation 1 verse 5, and purges, Psalm 79 verse 9, sin. A lost person will be judged unmercifully by the law of God at the judgment bar of God, also called the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20 verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. 12 And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. A saved person has his name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, Philippians 4 verse 3. He will not be judged in the same fashion. Without Jesus, there is no hope. Without him, the lake of fire awaits every man. And whosoever was not found written in the Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20 verse 15. Do you want to be judged on your own merits, Romans 3 verse 10, or on the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ? Wondering what to do call for a light. Acts 16 verse 29 Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas. 30 And brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 31 And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Romans 10 verse 13 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, God's salvation is freely offered to whosoever will come. Are you willing to admit your sinful condition and need for a savior? Or are you convinced that a loving God could never reject you no matter what you have done with his son? 
The truth reveals otherwise whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord is excluded from the whosoever found in the next verse. Revelation 20 verse 15 And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Why not fall upon your face before a loving God that took upon himself the form of a servant? For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. He became sin so that we could become righteous. Those born twice may die once, but those born once will die twice. Revelation 20 verse 6 Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. 22. The fourth witness. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. Deuteronomy 19 verse 15. Tampering with the God's holy word has negatively impacted the entire world. Unfortunately, the devastating outcomes caused by the modern version phenomenon have yet to fully bloom for all to see. However, the consequences of their acceptance by the general public have been compounding at an alarming rate. One of the most disheartening results has been the development of an increasingly shallow type of Christianity. Few things seem to please Satan like producing superficial lukewarm Christians. Today, the majority of professing Christians have grown accustomed to complacently sitting idle while God's truths are ignored, perverted and even shunned. Shamefully, those who profess to be making the Bible so easy to understand have caused the most serious damage. These modern-day Bible correctors with their easy-to-read versions have helped produce a type of Christianity lacking both authority and backbone. Too many church members want to be spoon-fed the word in small, easily digestible portions contrary to God's method of spiritual growth. God wants newborn baby Christians to grow up and enjoy the spiritual meat of his word, Hebrews 5 verses 12 to 14. The Lord designed his word so that only obedient and faithful students can unlock its innermost secrets. Those who reject infallibility are doomed to view it as a closed book unworthy of the effort necessary to discover its truths. God's true word is not difficult to recognize for those willing to devote the time necessary to investigate this modern era issue. False Bibles parallel counterfeit money. Some people are better trained at spotting counterfeit bills than others. Consider the difficulty encountered with passing counterfeit bills within a bank versus that of a convenience store. Bank tellers are trained to identify the imposter by studying the genuine article. The same principle holds true with respect to the Word of God. The best method by which to discern whether the modern versions are corrupt is to compare them with the real thing the King James Bible. Study the King James Bible, and you will be able to identify the many counterfeits. We have diligently attempted to do just that within the chapters of this book. True men of God have understood the principle that God magnifies his word above all his name. This is a remarkable fact considering how the scholars and the world in general treat his word. They look upon it with contempt. Can you imagine what it will be like when they stand before the Lord accountable for their actions? Do you really want to be a part of the spiritual infidelity that has wreaked havoc upon the church and the world? Do you magnify the same thing that God magnifies? Psalm 138 verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Dr. Dennis Coral points out in his book, Elements of a Godly Character, Volume 2, an important truth that each of us must understand and recognize. One of the most outstanding things about the character of God is found in Psalm 138 verse 2. He holds his word above his name. Why? Because if a man's word is no good, his name is no good. If God's word is no good, his name is no good. One now consider the motivation behind all of the modern versions, dollar, and the good names tarnished due to their association with these corrupt works. Proverbs 22 verse 1 A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. A tarnished name is not worth all of the money in the world. Today, a man's word may no longer be his bond, but God's word still is his. Consider the facts conveyed in John chapter 5. The Lord tells us about the four witnesses that bore witness of him. He begins with the lesser witness and moves on to the greater until he reveals the greatest witness of all. The narrative given resembles a court proceeding with witnesses giving testimony concerning the Lord and with a court reporter taking down the record of the proceedings. The testimony, 
or witness of a defendant during his own trial is received with suspicion, therefore, other witnesses must come forward on his behalf to substantiate the truth. Jesus said, John 5 verse 31 If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. 32 There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. The first witness John the Baptist. John 5 verse 33 Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. 34 But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. 35 He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. The second witness greater than John, Christ's works. John 5 verse 36 But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. The third witness greater than John and Christ's works, the Father. John 5 verse 37 And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. 38 And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. The fourth witness greatest of all, the scriptures. John 5 verse 39 Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The listing moves from the lesser, John, to the greatest, the scriptures. God elevates his word, the fourth witness, above all other things. The importance and magnitude of these truths should not be taken lightly by anyone. That which God elevates and esteems, Satan hates and vehemently attacks. He is the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. Therefore, one can understand why Satan and the world would attack the Savior and his book. However, it is inexcusable for any believer to do so. God elevates his word to the supreme position. Satan wants to tarnish the character of God by attacking his word. If one cannot trust God's word, the very character of God can be called into question. The record of the witnesses. As we have seen, John chapter 5 reveals the testimony of Christ's four witnesses. Three chapters later in the book of John, we read about the record of these witnesses. Our understanding of man's court system corresponds to the record referred to here. This record relates to the transcript, or record, of the witnesses' testimony produced by a court reporter. John 8 verse 13 The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. 14 Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came, and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come, and whither I go. Why would Jesus say that the witness of himself, John 5 verse 31, would not be true, but his record, here in chapter 8, would be true? With a little understanding of legal proceedings, one can quickly ascertain this simple truth. Although the testimony of what the witness says may be disputed, the record of what that witness said is indisputable. Even if the witness falsely testifies, the record of his testimony, preserved by the court reporter, would be correct and indisputable because it is simply a record of the witness testimony. The record of God's word far surpasses the testimony of man, the voice of God from heaven, and even the works of the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. Here is one aspect of that record. John 8 verse 12 Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled all of the Father's will. Thus, the Father proudly proclaimed from heaven that he was well pleased with his Son. Peter, James, and John heard this proclamation from heaven, Matthew 17 verses 1 to 5. It must have been an incredible event to witness. However, the Apostle Peter says that the scripture, or record, is a more sure word than even the voice of God from heaven at the transfiguration. Peter understood the principle the record of scripture far surpasses one's own experience no matter how great or glorious the experience. Here is the record. 2 Peter 1 verse 17 For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 18 And this voice which came from heaven we heard, when we were with him in the holy mount. 19 We have also a more sure word of prophecy, 
wherein ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts, twenty knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. 21 For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The scripture is a more sure word of prophecy. It is even greater than any voice heard from heaven, even if that voice emanates from God himself. Jesus proclaimed this truth, the Apostle Peter understood and expressed this truth. Why do the self-professed scholars and critics today miss the point altogether? We desperately need light. Our only hope of light comes from the Word of God. The Word of God provides light by revealing to us the Son, the Savior, and the supremacy of His Word. Rejecting this truth perpetuates darkness. Psalm 119 verse 130 The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. God's true words give light there is no contradiction in them. Selected verses throughout this book have been included as directed by the Holy Ghost of God in order to substantiate this truth. Thousands more could have been provided, but one more blatant corruption should suffice to reinforce the point. Take notice once again how these modern versions contradict themselves and the true word of God. This time they fall into the Greek trap. A single verse from John chapter 5 is compared to one in John chapter 8. The New International Version first says that the Lord's testimony is not valid and then three chapters later claims that his testimony is valid. Are both correct or is this just another modern version faux pas? Neve, John 5 verse 31 If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. Neve, John 8 verse 14 Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. Like its modern version counterpart, the New King James Version makes the same blunder, only using a different word. Remember the copyright requirements. The NKJV says his witness is not valid and then claims that it is valid. NKJV John 5 verse 31 If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. NKJV John 8 verse 14 Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. The modern versions consistently fall into their own man-made traps. Their translators claim to translate a single Greek word identically every time it is used in the scriptures. That is why the NIV uses testimony in both cases and the NKJV uses witness both times. The same Greek word is found in both verses. The Greek word can be translated either way testimony or witness. However, the King James translators were led by the Spirit of God to translate the same Greek word two different ways because they considered the general and immediate context. God blessed their efforts, and today we are blessed by their work and willingness to submit to God's leading. Since the King James translators used witness in chapter 5 and record in chapter 8, Christ, God's word, does not contradict himself in the KJB. When we study and consider the difference between the two words as we have done in this chapter, we can see and understand the truth. KJB John 5 verse 31 If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. KJB John 8 verse 14 Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came, and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come, and whither I go. When we compare scripture with scripture in the King James Bible, we gain clarity and spiritual understanding. When we compare verse with verse in the modern versions, we see contradiction and confusion. Yet, God is not the author of confusion any more than he is the author of these modern perversions. Any diligent Bible student will arrive at this conclusion every time. The book of 2 Timothy both commands man to study the Bible and explains the key that allows one to effectively do so. Interestingly, God uses a very descriptive noun in reference to the Bible student when he gives these instructions. God calls the student of his word a workman. This designation only applies to one who engages in difficult labor. In this case, the labor he is referring to is diligent study of his word. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Finding the truth takes work, especially today with all of the contradicting modern versions. Although the evidence points to the contrary, there are still those who would claim that the King James Bible is the more difficult translation to read. People say they can understand the modern versions better. 
Much of the perceived problem is self-inflicted because of man's unwillingness to put forth the necessary effort to study and understand the word of God. God has made unlocking of the truths in his word labor. These issues are not just 20th and 21st century problems they were addressed over four centuries ago by William Whitaker. Consider his insight. William Whitaker, 1547 to 1595, a professor at Cambridge University, wrote disputations on scripture to refute the Roman Catholic dogmas. Point two, Rome elevated the Latin Vulgate and the traditions of Rome as the rule of faith. Whitaker, like Bible believers today, held the scripture alone to be the rule of faith. Rome tried to discourage the common man from receiving the word by exaggerating the obscurities of the scriptures. Therefore, Whitaker answered these arguments and strategies by listing nine reasons why God ensured that only the workman could unlock his precious truths. These obscurities in the scriptures are planned and purposeful. The following are Whitaker's nine reasons why God designed his word to be grasped and understood only by those who diligently study it. 1. God would have us be constant in prayer and hath scattered many obscurities up and down through the scriptures in order that we should seek his help in interpreting them and discovering their true meaning. 2. God wished thereby to excite our diligence in reading, meditating upon, searching, and comparing the scriptures. 4. If everything had been plain, we should have been entirely slothful and negligent. 3. God designed to prevent our losing interest in them, for we are ready to grow weary of easy things. 4. God willed to have that truth, so sublime, so heavenly, sought and found with so much labor, the more esteemed by us on that account. For we generally despise and contemn, condemn, whatever is easily acquired, near at hand, and costs small or no labor, but those things which we find with great toil and much exertion, those, when once we have found them out, we esteem highly and consider their value proportionally greater. 5. God wished by this means to subdue our pride and arrogance, and to expose to us our ignorance. We are apt to think too honorably of ourselves, and to rate our genius and acuteness more highly than is fitting, and to promise ourselves too much from our science and knowledge. 6. God willed that the sacred mysteries of his word should be opened freely to pure and holy minds, not exposed to dogs and swine. Hence, those things which are easy to holy persons appear so many parables to the profane. For the mysteries of scripture are like gems, which only he that knows them values, while the rest, like the cock and Aesop, despise them and prefer the most worthless objects to what is most beautiful and excellent. 7. God designed to call off our minds from the pursuit of external things and our daily occupations, and transfer them to the study of the scriptures. Hence it is now necessary to give some time to their perusal and study, which we certainly should not bestow upon them if we found everything plain and open. 8. God desired thus to accustom us to a certain internal purity and sanctity of thought and feeling. For who bring with them profane minds to the reading of scripture, lose their trouble and toil, those only read with advantage, who bring with them pure and holy minds. 9. God will that in his church some should be teachers, and some disciples, some more learned, to give instruction, others less skillful, to receive it, so as that the honor of the sacred scriptures and the divinely instituted ministry might, in this manner be maintained. Whitaker conveys such profound truths applicable to every generation. His insights are absolutely correct, even in our 21st century context. A true student of God's word quickly realizes that the word of God is a book of inexhaustible truths, thus preventing his losing interest in the scriptures. He finds that his most exciting studies are those in which he expends the greatest effort. Those unwilling to be in a constant spirit of prayer, seeking the Lord's help, have frequently found their spiritual nuggets to be heretical pitfalls. Truly, only those in a spirit of prayerful humility are qualified to stand and teach the Bible. Furthermore, God's book will never be understood by the sluggard, Proverbs 13 verse 4, only by the workman. Praise God for his infinite wisdom and grace. The real Bible issue revolves not around readability or understandability, but labor and authority, Matthew 7 verse 29. Compare the comments of Whitaker with those of Mr. James White. His book, the King James Only Controversy, as we have seen, virulently and unapologetically attacks God's book. Once again, he writes, if the KJV has been your standard, have you ever really looked into why you accept it as such? 3. His purpose is to attack the one book that can make a difference in a person's life. Without God's written word, we have no final authority. 
Hopefully, after reading one book stands alone and one book one authority, you can affirmatively answer a resounding yes to Mr. White's inquiry. Having examined the evidence, the scriptural infidelity of the Bible critic is revealed to be an inexcusable sin, however, not an unforgivable one. Since God has nothing to do with the production of their modern versions, they have no hope of writing a Bible that is not self-contradictory. They are no better than blind leaders of the blind. They walk in darkness because only the entrance of God's word gives light. Since these versions choose to pervert the word, they produce darkness and cause others to stumble and fall. God's position is clear. We are to separate ourselves from those who cause division, and we are not to touch the products they produce. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17 Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. These modern versions are unclean. There is no need to read them, study them, or financially support them. This world needs a revival and a return to the things that make a country great, a family whole, and an individual pure. We hold the truth. You hold the truth. What are you doing with it? Times are coming when man will be searching for truth more than during any period in recent memory. Are you preparing yourself to obediently follow the scriptures? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3 verse 15 Christian, are you preparing your heart, mind, soul, and body to be ready to give an answer to those in search of the truth? Unfortunately, far too many Christians are simply sitting on the fence. 